Thank you very much for that extraordinarily kind uh, introduction. I, I find it difficult to uh, live up to it. Also, thank you for inviting me here again this evening. It's the second time. It's a privilege uh, to come here. Uh, the last time we were talking about the Climate Change Act and the global warming uh, thesis or the catastrophic uh, global warming thesis. And I think there are some analogies uh, between uh, that debate and the European debate, not obvious, but the debate about whether it's going to be a catastrophe in the climate because of the amount of carbon dioxide pushed into the climate, I find turns not around objective scientific facts and measurements, but around belief systems and it arguing against uh, some of the more extreme policies. One is often arguing with people who have a religious zeal about predicting that the planet is going to melt. There are similar arguments uh, around uh, the European Union. And I have been going around the country to universities, to different Labour parties, debating uh, the issue. Patrick and I had some fun in Birmingham University in their economics uh, department just before uh, Christmas. And it's been an interesting experience. And I, I'd like to uh, share that experience with you and hope uh, that sharing that experience, it can help all of us uh, in the debates between now and the 23rd of June. My favourite phrase invented last year, there are always great new words being put into uh, the Oxford English dic Dictionary, was virtue signalling. And it is one of those words that as soon as it's said, you recognise uh, that it describes almost exactly what uh, a lot of the debate and argument is about around the European Union. It's people saying we're good, we care about uh, the, uh, our fellow human beings in Europe and elsewhere. And they, they, they state how virtuous they are and don't look at the impact of the policies uh, that their own virtue leads them to support. Just describe two debates in the House of Commons uh, to give an example of that and to give an example of the arguments that we use. I guess even in a, an audience like this that focuses on issues of the European Union, not many people have paid much attention to the, the debate around the accession of uh, Croatia into the European Union. I have to say, if that is accurate, you share that with most members of Parliament. I went to, to the debate where the accession uh, treaty was being agreed by the House of Commons. And usually, on debates on Europe, there's myself and Kay Toe and Kelvin Hopkins, maybe one or two other Labour Eurosceptics, about twice as many um, Conservative Eurosceptics and maybe the front bench of both sides who are strongly pro EU, and maybe one uh, Conservative or Lib Dem and, and enthusiastic about the European Union project. So few people have turned up, I'd not applied for the debate. I stood up and made the more or less the following comments. Has anybody read what the assessment of our own scrutiny committee was? Has anybody read what uh, the European Union itself said, because what they were saying was that Croatia is a country without the rule of law, with corrupt courts, with a corrupt police system. It has one of the longest borders uh, within the European Union with uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina. Uh, and essentially, it did not pass any of the criteria. Having had this information, the EU, and this was agreed eventually, but without a vote, by the British Parliament, uh, thought this was, uh, Croatia was an ideal member of the uh, European Union. And what's more, unlike Bulgaria and Romania, uh, they would not be assessed for uh, their improvement in those areas uh, once they had joined. And I think they joined, I've not checked this fact, but I think it's the 1st of July 2000. And 
13. So people were standing up and saying it's good to extend the European Union, but this was giving a gateway to people traffickers, to drug smugglers, and to people who were protecting war criminals uh, in Croatia. But it was a, 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 a good uh, thing. So that was one debate, and I, I thought very hard about that afterwards. You think, why is nobody listening to the facts? But I, similarly, this afternoon, I went into the House of Commons and there was a non-votable debate on the European Union and European issues. I was slightly better attended. I had not put in to speak uh, again. I wish I had, because I, I, I was wound up uh, when I listened to Ella Reynolds uh, speak, because she came out with all the cliches that it is possible to come out with on the European Union. Uh, we're pulling up the drawbridge. As Roger said, we're not. We're looking out uh, to the rest of the, the world. We're actually improving our trade relationships. We're working with others, and this would stop us working with others. Well, we're not working with others. We are in a European Union where if we're in a minority, as we have been, and I think it's 72 decisions in the European Council uh, since majority voting started, we're in a minority. We're not working with other European countries, or we are working with them in the same way that a British government works with members of Her Majesty's loyal opposition. Because I, I, I've been on the side of being in government, then we won virtually all the votes, and now I'm in the opposition. And we lose all the votes. And that's how it is. It's not working together. It's debating and being part of uh, the, same uh, the same organization, but it's not working together. So it's just an inaccuracy. And I think we have to realize that what is being sold in these debates is something that sounds very good. Working together sounds very good. Pulling up the drawbridge sounds very bad, but neither of them are an accurate description of what is uh, going on. Worse than that at the moment, those debates aren't very well attended, but I think there is an increasing interest. I mean, some people might want the device on the telly uh, to switch it off every time the European Union is mentioned. But actually, there is an appetite out there for the arguments, for the facts about the uh, European uh, union. And what is shocking today and yesterday is from the Conservative government, they are trying to restrict their own cabinet ministers and junior ministers having access to information that will help uh, the debate. Uh, it is extraordinary. George Orwell uh, could have written about it. But if you think I'm trying to make a party political point that somehow the Conservatives are worse than the Labour Party in this respect. I'm not, because those small number of Labour MPs and a large number of Labour councillors and Labour Party members who are going around the country talking uh, to the Labour Party and trying to persuade them that it is sensible uh, to be in tune with our voters and to campaign to, to come out. The General Secretary of the Labour Party has written around to constituency Labour parties and said, Please don't invite these, uh, these people. It's not Labour Party policy to do this. Uh, you shouldn't be having that. A small number of Labour parties are taking notice of that. I'm pleased to say the vast majority uh, of them out aren't. But it is just simply bad faith to say that ministers can't have the facts so to inform the public and themselves, and that Labour Party members uh, can't have an open and honest debate uh, about what is going on. I just want to talk a little bit about the Labour Party's uh, position in this and why I think it is and why we're trying to change this and how it fits into the overall uh, debate on uh, whether or not we come out of the European Union. The, uh, the debate, when David Cameron made his statement on, on Monday, Jeremy uh, Corbyn, who every time I have ignored the Chief Whip's recommendation to vote on the European Union, Jeremy's been in the same lobby as me. 
as has the Shadow Chancellor John MacDonald lately, there has been, until they became leader and Shadow Chancellor, there has been no inconsistency in our views. And it was, it was slightly embarrassing, and Jeremy's got his problems, and I didn't vote for him for leader, but he is the leader. Uh, he's not doing so well in the opinion polls, but actually within the chamber, in, in Prime Minister's questions, he's done uh, quite well, but he didn't on Monday, because he put the party's position, which was to be in favour, and then he let his own views come out and put the opposite side, which was, which was interesting to hear, but not very effective in the chamber. Why is a natural outer, which Jeremy is, why is he put himself in that position? Well, what he says, and I've talked to him about it, is that he believes in a social Europe, and he believes in trying to put together an anti-austerity uh, uh, alliance. I think that the reason he's come to that position is because the trade unions are there, and he, he, he needs some friends uh, within the Labour movement uh, at the moment. Because the facts, it is an illusion that is held by many Labour MPs and many in the Labour and Trade Union movement, that there is something progressive uh, about the European Union and the way it is operating at the moment. And they look very embarrassed when I say, look at Greece, look at Portugal, look at Spain, look at Italy, look at Cyprus, and the, the determination of the European Central Bank and the European Commission and the IMF to force those countries into policies that they would never democratically choose has condemned a generation of young people, or half of them, and more than half of them in the case of Greece, uh, to unemployment and probably a very bad life experience. How that could be socially progressive? And how, as a Labour Party coming from the left, we can be supporting a European Union that pursues those policies is quite simply uh, be beyond uh, me. But it's worse than that. It's not just the competitive deflation that those uh, countries are forced into because they've been forced into the EU. The, uh, the Premier of Italy has been changed and not, uh, not been changed by the electorate. Probably the most left-wing government ever elected within the European Union is now just carrying out uh, the policies of the European Central uh, bank, trade union rights have disappeared and we may on this panel disagree about privatisation uh, but we can disagree and we can vote in our own bullet boxes on, 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 on that issue. But a government that doesn't believe in it, which is elected in Greece, is being forced uh, to do that. So I'm quite hopeful during this campaign that some of those realities will uh, come home in the uh, in the Labour Party, and there will be, I don't expect parties to change its position, that would be too difficult, but individuals will change their position. Because many of the policies that the Shadow Cabinet wants to pursue, whether it is taking the railways back into public ownership or taking control of energy policy more directly, would, if not impossible, be much more difficult within the European uh, Union. And beyond that, the decisions of the European Court of Justice on the minimum wage means that one of the things that the Labour Party from government is proudest of, and which a Conservative government is trying to emulate, a minimum wage, is now threatened because the Lavelle and Viking judgments basically say that you cannot have one minimum wage in one country. If you've got people of different countries working there, then you... you cannot impose the minimum wage of the higher country. So I think we're in for an interesting debate. I think it's important because of the figures that Roger gave, a third, a third, a third, that those of us in the Labour Party try to persuade our colleagues to shift because that is part of the debate. And we try to show uh, that actually the abstract nouns, the virtue signalling, is not in line with the reality of the European uh, Union. And I want to finish really on a point that Roger made, and I'll perhaps make it in a slightly uh, different way, 
But although I don't think it's going to be the reason that we'll win this referendum, and I do believe this referendum is winnable, I think the issues that will win the referendum is convincing people that the 100 billion uh, that we give to the European Union grows at the start of every parliament over that five years is not good value for money. And that in winning the debate, we have to show that every time there is 12 stars on a building uh, that the European Union has given a grant to, we could have two of those buildings if we weren't in the European Union because we wouldn't have sent that money uh, to the European uh, Union. But at the bottom of it, beyond that, I think it is about democracy. And you can call it sovereignty, you can call it taking control of our laws back. But I believe that since the, uh, <clears throat> the Enlightenment, it has been common right, left and centre that those people who set our taxes and make our laws should be subject to recall and being thrown out if they get it wrong. And that's the essence of democracy. And if you can't do that, you don't have a democracy. And I thought it was a great phrase that if you don't have sovereignty, you can't have security. It's essentially uh, the same point. And has there ever been a greater insult to British parliamentary democracy than to say if we want to slow down and get an unelected European Commission to relook at a law, we have to persuade the parliaments of Lithuania and Estonia and Slovenia and Croatia and another 10 countries which I, I'm not going to bore you with now, that before we can get them to look at bad laws, we have to get all those other parliaments to agree with us. That is an insult both to the parliamentary democracy and the people who elect uh, people to a parliamentary democracy. Again, as Roger said, I think the ne negotiations that uh, the Prime Minister has been through uh, have achieved nothing or little. He used us for little and got even uh, less. And I think that shows that there is no obvious reform of the European Union possibly possible. And there are that reasonable group of people who say, well, if only we could make it better, then we would vote for it. It is not possible to make it better because they're on a train trying to create a super state. And I don't want to be on that train. I want to be on a train where we have our own parliamentary democracy and I can disagree with Patrick and Roger and people who vote can decide whose policies uh, they agree with. So I... To go back to the very first point, I don't think we can win this just on uh, facts. We have to expose the fact that, that the other side are selling fairy stories. But actually, there is not a risk-free alternative. We have to show that the biggest risk to the future of this country and to the wealth of our individuals and to the country is staying in the EU, and that there is a much brighter future in all probability. Future is not normal, absolutely. By again becoming self-governing, trading with the rest of the world, and using money raised by our own taxes to invest in our own infrastructure. I genuinely believe that debate is winnable, but we have to be aware of the nature of the arguments that are being put by the other side. Thank you again for inviting me.